This video is sponsored by ESET Digital Security. Progress protected with ESET. 1,092 feet, displacing over 100,000 tons. It's the American Ford-class supercarrier and the most powerful warship in the world. But aircraft carriers weren't always the kings of the seas, and in fact, they were almost canceled altogether. In 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright achieved the first controlled and sustained flight of a powered, heavier-than-air aircraft. Man's dream of soaring through the heavens was finally a reality thanks to the invention of the internal combustion engine. But no technology has ever been as widely and quickly adopted as the airplane. And just seven years after the Wright brothers' historic flight, naval officers around the world were already dreaming of what this new machine could do for their fleets. In 1910, American aviator Eugene Burton Eli would undertake the first successful takeoff from a ship, launching his small plane off the deck of the U.S. Navy's USS Birmingham. But taking off was one thing, landing was something altogether different. And if airplanes and ships were going to be married for combat operations, then they'd have to land on a ship as well as take off from one. Two months after his historic flight, Eli once more made history by landing his Curtis Pusher onto the deck of the USS Pennsylvania while anchored in San Francisco Bay. He had proven that airplanes could not just take off from a ship, but return to it upon completing a mission. But the way forward for naval aviation required airplanes to be able to land on a ship while the ship moved, an altogether different proposition than settling down on calm waters inside a harbor. On May 9, 1912, Commander Charles Sampson of the British Royal Navy proved that the airplane could operate from the deck of a warship deployed in harm's way by landing his short, improved S-27 biplane on the deck of the HMS Hibernia. Airplanes had been quickly identified as invaluable tools for a seaborne naval force, but the problem was that deploying and recovering aircraft was difficult. The idea of the aircraft carrier had just made a gigantic leap forward, a real moment of progress that would eventually lead to something that once seemed completely impossible. Progress can mean a lot of different things, though, and for the sponsor of today's video, ESET Digital Security, progress means protection. The world is rapidly changing, just as it was at the beginning of the 20th century. Today, digital worlds are becoming more and more complex, but this kind of ongoing progress needs to be safeguarded in order to continue and flourish. That's why, wherever technology enables progress, ESET Digital Security is here to protect it. ESET is a global digital security company whose ethos I truly believe in, which is why I'm so happy to recommend them. They're privately owned and independent, with a commitment to the same mission statement they've kept since they were founded over three decades ago, ensuring that their customers always have the best protection possible. They've grown from a self-made pioneering antivirus company to a digital security powerhouse, with 13 global research labs driving the development of ESET's unique technology. It's no surprise that ESET is protecting millions of customers and thousands of companies worldwide, with over 440 million devices and counting protected. I'm a huge fan of ESET Internet Security, which is ideal for the user who's concerned about their privacy while shopping, banking, and working online, which, let's be honest, is virtually everyone. It provides a ransomware shield that monitors and evaluates applications to detect and block ransomware attempts before they can even start. It also gives you a firewall, banking and payment protection, and it even has a scanning engine to identify exploits that appear in malformed document files. With ESET Internet Security, you've never been more protected while online. Which is why I'm so happy that ESET is offering viewers of the Infographic Show an extended 90-day free trial to make sure that your progress remains protected too. The first 500 users to sign up with our special code also get 50% off. So don't wait, go to the link in the description and sign up now to make sure that you and the technology you use every day are protected with ESET Internet Security. And now back to what I like to call the ESET of the high seas, the aircraft carrier. The new machines allowed for far better scouting capabilities than was ever possible before, and it could also be used for far more accurate spotting of friendly fire with the aid of a simple radio. Wireless telegraphy was used to send messages in Morse code, and once the potential for the airplane was fully realized by military leaders, the marriage of these two technologies was inevitable. In 1911, the technology was put to the test successfully during the Italo-Turkish War. And in 1912, the Royal Flying Corps was experimenting with wireless telegraphy and aircraft. The technology was slow to be adopted, as early radios were very bulky and difficult to operate. Plus, they were easy for the enemy to intercept and target with artillery fire, destroying listeners on the ground. Nonetheless, in April 1915, the first true radio message was relayed from a ground station to a flying airplane, and the potential of the airplane as a weapon of war both over land and sea exploded. Early naval aircraft, however, were mostly seaplanes, which would be carried and recovered by seaplane tenders, 
chips specifically designed to support naval aircraft and widely considered to be the first aircraft carriers. The French were the first to field a seaplane tender, the La Foudre, which carried float-equipped planes inside hangars on the main deck. A crane would be used to lower them down to the sea from where they could take off and fly. Recovery was equally simple. The seaplane would simply land on the ocean near the tender and then get picked up by the ship's crane. With World War I, naval aviation was quickly put to the test. On the 5th of September 1914, the Imperial Japanese Navy launched the world's first naval-launched air raid. Four seaplanes were launched to attack German communication and command centers in the Tsingtao Peninsula with moderate success. The total amount of munitions a plane could carry into combat was still very limited due to the low horsepower of early engines. However, the raid caught the Germans by surprise and helped sow discord. The Japanese would also have the honor of launching the first nighttime raid by aircraft during the same campaign. On Christmas Day of 1914, though, the seaplane would prove to the world that Navy aviation was an increasingly potent and critical weapon of war. The Germans had been harassing the British with bombing raids executed via zeppelins, and in response the British sought to destroy German zeppelins and their mooring stations on the ground, or at least damage them enough to force their retreat. The targets were the Zeppelin sheds at the Nordholz Air Base near Cuxhaven, and the British deployed seaplane tenders HMS Engadine, Riviera, and Empress, supported by a group of cruisers, destroyers, and submarines, to try to deal with the problem. The goal was to get a good fix on the location of the Zeppelin sheds, and if possible to bomb them from the air. If not, their coordinates could be relayed to warships who could engage them with long-range fire. Nine planes were lowered into the freezing water, but only seven of them managed to fire up their engines and take to the sky. The other two were recovered and winched back on board. Each plane was carrying three 20-pound bombs, and after flying through thick fog and low cloud cover, finally reached the German Zeppelin base. Heavy anti-aircraft fire fended off the bulk of the attack, but the early bombers managed to cause some damage to the Zeppelins and their ground station, with zero losses on their side. Largely symbolic, the raid was a huge boost to the British and proved that the aircraft carrier could be an invaluable tool of war. Seaplanes, however, had multiple disadvantages that severely limited their effectiveness. First, they needed extremely calm seas to launch and land on, which made them useful only when the weather was cooperative. If the weather worsened while on a mission, the seaplane might be a total loss upon return. Second, the big floats the planes relied on to operate from the surface of the ocean were very heavy, and thus limited their range, endurance, and payload. The floats also created a great deal of drag, which slowed the planes down significantly. It was obvious seaplanes were not the future, and yet launching off the decks of converted cruisers and battleships was still very dangerous. Often these ships would have one or more turrets removed and replaced with flat decking for a plane to land and launch from. However, the ship's superstructure would cause turbulence that could spell disaster for a pilot taking off or landing. It was obvious that naval aviation required a ship specifically dedicated to it, but many of the traditionalists in the navies around the world fought the concept. After all, cruisers, destroyers, and battleships were all proven concepts that could deliver large amounts of steel on target, while these flimsy airplanes could hardly carry themselves aloft. Nevertheless, ships with flush decks were eventually constructed, leading to the first truly recognizable aircraft carriers. In 1918, the HMS Argus became the first carrier in the world capable of launching and recovering aircraft from its own deck, a massive step forward in naval aviation. Now the big heavy floats could be ditched improving performance and payload. Additionally, airplanes could operate in more difficult sea states than before, though early carriers were still very limited in when they could safely launch and recover aircraft. Aircraft carriers got a massive boost after World War I thanks to the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922. In the post-war era, it was feared that a new naval arms race would ensue, and the treaty sought to negotiate acceptable limits on how many and what types of ships each nation could build. To meet the strict requirements of the treaty, many heavy cruisers and battleships already in construction were converted and sent to aircraft carriers, setting the stage for the aircraft carrier's prominent role during World War II. By the time the Second World War rolled around, naval aviation had taken a significant technological leap. Engines were much more powerful, allowing for much faster and heavier armed aircraft. Finally, the airplane was not just a serious threat to traditional naval firepower, but completely trumped it even if most nations still hadn't realized that fact. Two famous raids would change that perception forever and make the aircraft carrier the dominant warfighting vessel of any navy, ending the reign of the battleship. The first was the British raid on the Italian fleet while moored at their base in Toronto, launching from the HMS Illustrious, 21 fairy swordfish biplanes armed with torpedoes flew under the cover of darkness on the night of the 11th of November 1940. Several Italian ships were moored in shallow water, making an attack by submarine impossible. 
the British planes, however, managed to brave withering anti-aircraft fire and disabled three battleships and damaged one heavy cruiser and two destroyers, all at the cost of two aircraft and four crew. 21 airplanes had just inflicted a devastating blow on the Italian fleet, and naval planners around the world sat up and took notice. Perhaps none more so than the Japanese, which planned their own surprise attack against the United States. At the start of the war, the Japanese had a serious problem. Their ambitions for a Western Pacific Empire were under threat by the US, which provided it with much of its oil and materials needed for both its military and industry. With the US forces positioned in strategically important choke points across the South Pacific, if Japan was ever going to stand on its own two feet, it needed to force the US out of the Pacific. But the US absolutely dwarfed Japan in terms of industrial might. Though, thanks to the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922, the US had not been allowed to expand its already large lead over the Japanese in fighting ships. Thus, Japan set out to deliver a crippling body blow to the US Navy that it couldn't recover from. And on Sunday, December 7, 1941, the Japanese launched the largest naval raid in history dealing significant damage to the U.S. ships stationed at Pearl Harbor. However, the surprise attack came while the U.S. carriers were out at sea, and not a single American carrier was lost, a fact that would ensure the plan to knock the U.S. out of the Pacific in one move would fail. The aircraft carrier was officially the top dog at the sea, and the Pacific theater would be defined largely by the clash of aircraft carriers and their onboard fleets of planes. For the first time in history, ships launched attacks against each other without even being in visual range of one another and protecting large formations of ships from enemy air attack was a vital concern. This led to the creation of light escort carriers, typically holding a much smaller complement of aircraft and designed to provide air cover for groups of friendly ships. The escort carrier was also tasked with providing convoy security against enemy submarine attack. Subs had to spend the majority of their time on the surface because of their batteries that had to constantly be recharged with the diesel engines, and they could only run those engines on the surface where they could vent the poisonous exhaust. This left submarines very vulnerable to attack from enemy scout planes on the lookout for submarines, making most crews practice emergency crash dives extensively. After World War II, naval aviation underwent another major revolution with the adoption of the jet engine and thus jet aircraft. These new extremely high-performance aircraft required special modifications to existing carriers, and new innovations allowed for faster recovery and launch of aircraft to increase the tempo of air operations. During World War II, hydraulics were used to help catapult aircraft off the decks of carriers. With the increased weight of high-performance jet aircraft, this was no longer sufficient, and catapults were now powered by steam generated inside massive boilers. The steam builds up incredible pressure, which is released mechanically, driving the aircraft forward on the deck and getting it up to flight speed by the time it leaves the end of the deck. In some navies, like the current Chinese Navy, a ski ramp-like extension on the flight deck was added to give the plane an extra boost and help it get aloft. However, this required a trade-off in weight for a launched airplane, thus forcing aircraft to choose between less fuel or less munitions. Steam-powered catapults have proven to be extremely reliable, with U.S. Nimitz carriers reporting that they've been able to use at least one of their four catapults 99.5% of the time. That's an incredible upkeep time for any system and ensures that carriers are always ready for air operations. However, steam catapults are also extremely inefficient and can't be finely tuned for different aircraft. This means that a steam catapult can put extreme wear and tear on an airframe and significantly lower its service life. It also makes the launching of light, unmanned aerial vehicles impossible, as they would be torn apart by the sheer power of the steam catapult. Electromagnetic launch systems, however, generate magnetic fields to push a carriage along a track and launch an aircraft. EMALS, as it's known in the US, can be finely tuned for each specific aircraft, decreasing the stress on each individual airframe and extending the service life of a plane. It also allows for the launching of light unmanned aerial vehicles such as reconnaissance drones. Perhaps the biggest improvement, though, is the 45-second recharge time. Traditional steam catapults can take around two minutes to launch an aircraft. This greatly reduces the amount of time it takes to get an air wing in the air, lowering fuel consumption for loitering aircraft waiting for their buddies and helping get aircraft airborne in an emergency. However, the technology is still technically in testing and experiencing a dramatically greater rate of failure than traditional steam catapults. As of right now, EMAL simply cannot meet Navy requirements of one failure for every 4,166 launches. During testing in 2021, the USS Gerald R. Ford experienced failure after only 181 launches. With the EMAL system being integral to the development of the new Ford-class carriers, which are already being built, if these issues aren't corrected, the US Navy could find itself unable to reliably prosecute an air war against its greatest potential adversary, China. 
New technology also allowed for the construction of new types of carriers. Landing helicopter dock ships took on the task of providing air mobility and support for ground forces during amphibious operations. These ships, such as the American Wasp class, are capable of ferrying an entire expeditionary unit onto a hostile beach, either via landing crafts or air. They're equipped with attack and transport helicopters, as well as short takeoff vertical landing or Stovall or vertical takeoff and landing VTOL aircraft. These include the famous Harrier and the new F-35 Lightning II, which is capable of operating off extremely short flight decks thanks to its Stovall abilities. Smaller and lighter than traditional aircraft carriers, LHD and LHA landing helicopter assault ships are not meant to be the tip of the spear, but rather are meant to operate alongside traditional carriers. In an emergency, however, they're capable of providing much-needed air cover for friendly forces, thanks to their unique aircraft, which can take off and land from extremely short runways. However, inevitably, this comes at a trade-off of fuel and armament, making LHD and LHA aircraft less well-armed than their carrier and supercarrier cousins. VTOL aircraft, however, don't need another major adaptation of aircraft carriers. The arresting wires designed to safely catch an incoming aircraft. As a pilot approaches his home carrier, he must somehow bring his jet from a speed of well over 100 knots to a complete standstill on an extremely short runway. Normally, this would be impossible, which is why carrier planes come equipped with tail hooks that are dropped on the approach to the carrier. These tail hooks are built right into the core structure of the plane itself, and is one reason why carrier planes are far sturdier than their non-carrier counterparts. As the pilot comes down for a landing, he's guided by a series of signals from a landing signal officer who directs him via radio. The LSO is responsible for gauging glide slope, altitude, and airspeed, and helping the pilot come down successfully on a deck which could be getting tossed around in turbulent seas. On touchdown, the landing hook scrapes along the ground where it runs across several arresting wires. These wires will catch the aircraft and bring it to a safe, not-so-gentle stop. However, both the arresting hook and the wires have to be powerful enough to resist the incredible power of a modern jet fighter running at near full throttle. Because unlike a conventional landing, a carrier landing requires the pilot to immediately throttle up the engine. This is done so that if the tailhook manages to miss all the arresting wires, the plane doesn't simply run off the edge of the deck and plunge into the sea. Instead, by giving the engines more power, the plane should continue to have the required speed to achieve lift and get safely back up into the air. Each carrier has its superstructure concentrated in an area known as the island. This feature first appeared in 1923 on the HMS Hermes and was a dramatic improvement to previous designs. Carriers with flush decks might have been a smaller target for enemy guns, but suffered from a host of problems that made operations difficult. Exhaust from both the aircraft carrier and the ship itself would often roll across the deck and onto the command section of the carrier, and without the ability to sit above the flight deck, managing traffic on the deck was very difficult. It also left nowhere to put radar and made navigation of the ship itself difficult. Eventually, flush deck designs were completely eliminated in favor of the more iconic island-designed aircraft carriers you think of today. The most revolutionary change in aircraft carriers, however, came with the adoption of nuclear power. In 1961, the new USS Enterprise became the first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier in the world. The advantages of a nuclear aircraft carrier are overwhelming in comparison with conventionally powered carriers. With no need to refuel for decades, nuclear carriers can operate non-stop during times of conflict and need only replenishment of fuel and armaments for its aircraft and food for its crew. Nuclear carriers also generate more power than traditional ships, which allows them to power up more current and future technologies. They also move faster, with the American Ford class capable of moving at a classified speed in excess of 30 knots or 35 miles per hour. This is important for getting firepower to conflict zones around the world, but also for evading enemy attack aircraft and missiles. Currently, only the US and France operate nuclear carriers, with the US operating 10 Nimitz-class carriers and one Gerald R. Ford-class carrier, and with France operating the Charles de Gaulle. Nuclear power aboard naval ships has proven to be an extremely safe and reliable technology, with the US Navy operating over 80 nuclear-powered ships during a period of 5,400 reactor years without a single accident. Today, though, the future of the aircraft carrier is in serious question. Ever-advancing missile technologies have begun to seriously threaten the survivability of a modern carrier, and with China operating hundreds of carrier-killer ballistic missiles, it's not known if the US Navy could protect its big carriers during a possible confrontation in the South Pacific. This growing threat has prompted the development of numerous anti-ballistic missile technologies, but the best defense seems to be staying out of the way altogether, with the US Navy adopting unmanned tanker aircraft that can ferry their fighters and strike aircraft hundreds of miles to a fight 
while keeping the carrier outside of the threat envelope of enemy ballistic missiles. Detractors of modern carriers claim that the US Navy would be better served with a fleet of smaller, more agile carriers that would be individually harder to target and destroy. Concentrating so much firepower into one ship makes it a formidable weapon of war, but also means the loss of just one carrier means the loss of approximately 75 aircraft and up to 5,000 sailors, a horrific loss of hardware and lives both. But more widely dispersing naval aviation forces would also make the operating costs increase dramatically. Thus, the idea has been so far canned by the US Navy, even if many fear that the United States has failed to identify a shift in naval doctrine as dramatic as the one that made the carrier the premier weapon of naval war in World War II. This could potentially leave US forces in an extremely compromising situation should war break out against a foe like China or even Russia. For now, the US Navy aims to maintain a fleet of 11 carriers supported by 9 landing helicopter assault carriers. As the Nimitz class of carriers ages out of service, they'll be replaced by the new bigger Ford class, which boasts multiple technological improvements. Its twin AB1 nuclear reactors put out three times the power of the Nimitz class reactors, 600 megawatts versus 200, and that's enough juice to power a small city, and it'll be needed for many of the existing and future technological add-ons being brought onto the ship. One of those projected additions are laser weapons for close-in defense against enemy missiles, aircraft, and most importantly, small waterborne craft. During war games in the early 2010s, it was discovered that a big supercarrier could be destroyed by a far less capable opponent, such as Iran, by using a swarm of small suicide boats. The results were so shocking that the new Ford is now equipped with four Phalanx close-in weapon systems and four M250 caliber machine guns, all of which are more than capable of destroying small enemy vessels before they have a chance to swamp the big carrier. Laser weapons are already in testing by the US Navy, promising to add even greater capabilities by acquiring and firing on targets in milliseconds, allowing a single battery of lasers to service large amounts of targets at incredible speed. However, the biggest firepower upgrade will be the two squadrons of F-35C Joint Strike Fighters, making up between 20 to 24 aircraft. These are the only carrier-based stealth fighters in the world and can operate in conjunction with the additional two squadrons of F-18 Super Hornets by directly feeding them targeting data and guiding their weapons to their target in environments too dangerous for the non-stealthy Super Hornets to operate in. As the F-35 proves itself over the coming years, it'll eventually completely phase out the F-18. But for now, the Navy retains a large number of F-18s so as to remain mission-ready should the F-35s prove to be ineffective in modern combat. That is, until the sixth-generation carrier fighter program, even now in development, delivers the next generation of carrier fighter and new revolution in naval warfare. Despite misgivings about the future of big carriers, the firepower they bring to a fight is undeniable. The US Navy by itself is the world's third-largest air force. However, only time will tell if these floating superweapons can remain viable in the face of ever-evolving threats. The loss of a $12 billion supercarrier to a $10 million ballistic missile is not something the US could easily absorb and even one carrier loss would be a significant blow to the capabilities of the US Navy. Despite this, American planners remain confident that their carriers can meet both current and future threats, though one only hopes they aren't making the mistake of once more fighting the last war instead of preparing for the next. Now go check out why living on an aircraft carrier sucks, or click this other video instead.